So uh, I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to be doing this for the next hour. Uh, but greetings from New York. Uh, I left New York this morning. Uh, it, it's actually warmer in New York today than it is here, which surprised me because it's been about 40 degrees for the last uh, two months. So lovely to be here today. Um, Two things, I'll just give you a little brief background on me so you sort of understand where I'm coming from. And then we'll talk about how research and insights can drive uh, strategy for sure, and in, in many cases, creative. Uh, as Froka said, uh, my title is the Global Director of Brand Intelligence, which is a very fancy ad agency title for the guy who does research. Uh, when I first got there, they said I could have any title I wanted as long as it didn't have the words research in it anywhere. So that, that was the title we ended up using. Um, I've been doing that for about 14 years. J. Walter Thompson, if you don't know them, they're one of the fifth largest ad agencies in the world. Uh, we have over 130 offices in over 95 countries. Uh, and it is the oldest surviving ad agency. So we are 152 years old as of this year. Um, we like to say we're not good because we're old, we're old because we're good. Okay. Uh, but most of my career, I actually spent on the market research side, working for two companies that do uh, custom quantitative market research for clients uh, in, the, in the business world. Uh, in my spare time, I'm an adjunct at NYU and Columbia, teaching in uh, graduate programs for strategic communications. I'm also a board member of an organization called the AEF, the ANA Educational Foundation, which looks to bridge uh, the worlds of students, uh, academic institutions, and the marketing and advertising world and come up with programs for those folks. Um, I live in a place called Long Island, which is right off of New York City. Uh, it's a little town called Massapequa. If you ever heard of something called Hurricane Sandy, uh, pretty much everyone in the two miles all along here got absolutely devastated. Uh, one of the guys on my train literally came back to his house and found two lobsters and a 10-pound catfish in his living room. I mean, the ocean just sort of came up, dumped stuff off, and then receded and destroyed everything. Uh, I'm a huge music fan. Uh, for those of you under the age of 40, those things are called record albums. <laughs> I used to buy those and listen to those. Um, and in my spare time, I play in a band. That's an old picture of me. Um, we play all over Long Island and New York City. We're all researchers, so we're called the outliers. It's either the outliers or the standard deviations, right? We don't like the outliers. Um, so how does market research drive creativity and strategy? First thing is um, I love quotes, yeah? And uh, this is one of my favorite ones. The next best thing to being clever is being able to quote someone who is. So I'm not so clever, so I'm going to use a lot of other people to quote. Uh, <clears throat> why do we care? about insights and research to drive strategy. Uh, it's because of this concept we have in research that the sample of one is often wrong and it's kind of useless, right? The sample of one is you get in a room and you're trying to figure out a strategy and someone says, you know, I think, and I always say, look, I'm not trying to be rude, but I really don't care what you think, right? Uh, my students do that a lot when we're working on projects. They go, well, you know, I think, and I say, you know, not for nothing, but you're one person, right? And you live in New York, and you're probably in the top quarter of people in terms of intelligence and income and education in the country. You are pretty far from typical, right? So you have to go out and get some insights by talking to real people. You are entitled, you are not entitled to your opinion. You are entitled to your informed opinion. No one is entitled to be ignorant, right? And one of the things I love teaching in New York is there's, of course, like a real New York bias about how we see the world. 
and we do some focus groups, right, some qualitative research with people in New York, and they sort of get a sense of what's going on. And then we do a national survey across the whole U.S. And when the data comes back, the students are always like, who are these people? And why do they think this, right? This is crazy. Um, but that's why we have to do research, because it's highly unusual that our experience is going to be representative of the diversity of opinions and experiences that exist in the larger audience that we're trying to measure. Because what we say, me search and research are two very different things, right? And we need to understand the subtle differences between those two. Bill Bernback, who uh, founded an agency called DDB, known for its strategic and creative firepower, he said, you know, at the heart of every effective creative philosophy is the belief that nothing is so powerful as an insight into human nature. What compulsions drive a man, what instincts dominate his action, even though his language often camouflages what really motivates him. If you can get to what makes people do what they do and understand that at a very visceral level, you have a very powerful tool to help understand how you communicate to them, regardless of what you're trying to get them to do. Right? If you're trying to get them to buy your brand of toothpaste, or if you're trying to get them to vote a certain way, or if you're just trying to get them to support a certain point of view in the world. If you understand what really motivates people. And the point that Bernback makes here, that the language people use about their motivations camouflages what really motivates them is really important. Because in research, what people often tell us is pretty distant from what actually motivates them, right? So we have to get very clever in how we sort of unpack that a bit. Phil Dusenberry, who ran BBDO, another big uh, global ad agency. In the advertising business, a good idea can inspire a great commercial, but a good insight can fuel a thousand ideas and a thousand commercials. Because once you have the key to what makes people tick, you can do amazing things with that. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. And insight creates a whole new way of thinking. People think about things in ways that were previously inexpressible, if that's a word. Yeah. Andy Grove from Intel, altogether too often, people substitute opinions for facts and emotions for analysis. Right? And I'm going to try and make this distinction that insights are not facts. Insights are something much deeper and much more powerful. This is my boss at J. Walter Thompson. He runs strategic planning around the world. And he once said, you know what, at the end of the day, without consumer insights, we're really just kind of making stuff up. And it's true. And sometimes you can make stuff up and be right. But many times you make stuff up and you're way off base. And you don't even know you're off base. So what do insights have to do with anything? I'll tell you a little story. Uh, this is allegedly a true story that happened to a strategic planner working for Saatchi and Saatchi in Milan. And the story is that when he went to work every day, he would walk through this little public square. And when he walked through, he would see this gentleman sitting there with uh, dark glasses, a cane, and a cup, and a sign that said, I am blind. Yeah? And he sort of didn't pay a whole lot of attention to him. He'd walk by him in the morning. He'd walk by him when he left in the evening. And one day he sort of noticed something about the guy is that he wasn't doing very well. He wasn't getting a lot of people to donate to him. And one day as he was walking by, he stopped in front of the man. And the man heard his feet shuffle a bit. And he reached out for his can, and he shook his can. And he said to the guy, you know, if I could, instead of giving you money, could I give you something else? Could I, could I write on your sign? And the guy said, sure, sure. So he wrote on it, it's a beautiful spring day, and I am blind. And allegedly, the guy suddenly started getting tons of donations, right? What did he do? He turned a fact. I am blind, 
which he didn't even need the sign because the glasses, the cup, and the cane kind of gave that away. And he made it relevant to people, right? He said to people, by writing that line, he said, it's a beautiful spring day, the sky is blue, the flowers are in bloom, the birds are out, and you can see all of that and I can't. And suddenly people understood, right? People felt empathy. Their motivation to donate was that now they felt a connection to this guy. They understood his plight better, right? That's an insight. In communication strategy, we always talk about that if you address a certain group of people and convey a motivating story to them, you can get them to behave in any way you want. But it starts with understanding what story do we tell them? What story is going to motivate people to do what we want them to do? Right? This is one way to motivate people. This makes a connection, right? People laugh, they giggle, and they donate money to them. Here's another version of that. That's my favorite one. It takes you a minute to get it. But okay, you don't like that one. I like that one. I like that one. Uh, this one's good too. Free Wi-Fi, great beer. Uh, here's another good one. Come in and try the worst meatball sandwich that one guy on Yelp ever had in his life. <laughs> another one resonant. Zombies cannot swim. Get a boat. Yeah. And this one is, this one is my favorite one. This is a, a real ad that ran in the Des Moines Register. Olds 1999 intrigue. Totally uncool parents who obviously don't love their teenage son selling his car only driven for three weeks before Snoopy mom, who needs to get a life, found booze under the front seat. $3,700 or best offer, call the meanest mom on the planet. All the mothers in the room get that. Kids don't get it. So we're talking a lot about insights, right? What, but what is an insight? Yeah, I, I started by going to the dictionary. The dictionary says, uh, an, in, an insight is an, an, an instance of apprehending the true nature of a thing, especially through an intuitive understanding, a penetrating mental vision or discernment, the faculty of seeing the inner character, the underlying truth. There are certain words in here that I think are more important than others. So it is something that is true. It is real. You're not making it up. Intuitively, it feels right because it feels like we understand how to connect at that level. It's the inner character. It's not obvious always that it's there. And it's the underlying truth. It's something that doesn't always present itself so easy. You have to dig to get to it. Defining an insight is tricky. It's like the old saying, defining beauty, ask 10 people, you'll get 10 definitions of it. But like beauty, when you, when you hear an insight revealed, you know it's right. You can almost feel it. It feels incredibly relevant. That slide's not working, is it? What the rest of it says, because I've given this lecture so many times, uh, an insight is usually not obvious nor evident. If it's something obvious, it's probably not an insight. Moms prefer to grocery shop on Saturday mornings. That's not an insight. That's a fact. It's a finding. It's a statistic. Why do moms prefer to shop on Saturday mornings? That might be an insight. It's a chore. They don't really want to be doing it, but they've been with the kids all week. They've kind of had it up to here, and this is something they can do on their own, and that feels really good. Right? That is an insight. That's something you can do something with when you understand that motivation. An insight usually comes from connecting multiple facts together. 
Moms like to grocery shop on Saturday mornings. Uh, children are more overcommitted than they've ever been. Moms prefer to use social media to connect with each other. Connecting all those dots start to tell us a narrative about our target audience, in this case moms, and what they want to think about and what motivates them to do what they want. And insight, therefore, requires a leap of interpretation because you have to connect disparate facts together to get to something. Yeah. Therefore, it requires thinking. And it requires courage, because you don't always have the data. My students always do that. They're like, I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, I'm looking for the insight. I'm like, they're not in there. Stop looking for them. Find the facts, put the facts up on the wall, look at all the facts, think about what they have to do with each other, and then the insights will begin to emerge. So stop looking for them. This is what a lot of people do. They confuse an insight with a finding. An insight needs to be created. You need to create it in your head. And the reason it requires courage is because then you have to tell someone else how you got to that insight. You have to build an argument. You have to build the case how you got there. That's what I spend most of my time doing. Standing in front of clients, telling them, bringing them along on our journey, how we understood what we understand to be true. Right? It's the old saying, discovery is looking at the same thing as everybody else, but thinking something different. Everybody has the same data today. And we have more of it than we know what to do with. The key is how do you think about it in a way that other people haven't thought about it before. There's a funny thing about insights, though. Once one is revealed, they almost always seem ridiculously obvious. To which I always say, well, I didn't hear you say it, so it can't be that obvious. But it seems obvious because it feels really relevant. And when it feels relevant, it means you are making a connection at a very visceral level with people. Good insights usually evoke one of these type of responses from the audience we're talking to. Hey, I know what that feels like. You know what, I know what you're talking about. That happened to me too. Those are the kind of things, when you hear those, you know you're close to an insight. You know you're tapping into something strong. Scott Bedberry was the chief marketing officer at Nike when they created the Just Do It campaign, which is largely heralded as one of the most successful ad campaigns ever. And he talks about insights in a way that I really like. <clears throat> he says, insights have far more in common with intuition and imagination than it does with deliberate conscious thinking based on deductive reasoning. It's much more right brain than left brain. Even though we're using data it's much more of a right brain exercise than it is a left brain exercise. Insights are not facts. People don't tell you insights, and statistics don't identify them. Insights have to be discovered, <clears throat> which means that discovering an insight is more part of an organic creative process than it is a linear formulaic research protocol. This is not to say that getting to good data is not important. It's very important. But what you do with the data once you have good data, that's the creative part. There is room for creativity in research, data, insight, and strategy. I just like that picture. Sorry. Friend of mine who uh, uh, works with buying research. He says, you know, in his mind, there's a hierarchy of research results. At the very bottom end, you have data. With enough data, you can get to information. With enough information, you can get to knowledge. And with enough knowledge, you can get to insights. A lot of companies purport that they can get you to insights. Very few actually do. Most tell you the facts, the knowledge, the learning. But that's only half the battle. 
This is where insights come from. So let's say you go out and you do some research, and that can be any variety of research. You go out and do secondary research, you collect information, you talk to people on the street, you do focus groups, you monitor social media, you look at web stream data, you do surveys, and you get some learnings. Each of these dots is a piece of learning. It's a piece of information. Moms like to grocery shop on Saturday mornings. Kids are more overcommitted than ever before. And we have to think about each of those dots, each of those pieces of learning, and say to ourselves, what does that mean? What's the connective tissue that pulls all those together? Then we look at what's happening in culture relevant to the category we're studying. And we think about what are all the things happening in culture today? What are all those learnings? And how do those connect together? And then we think about what do we know about how brands behave and how consumers behave in this category? Connect all those dots and think about what does those mean when we pull those together? And insights live at the junction of this. You need to interrogate all of them. One of the mistakes people make is they just look at one data source and they kind of figure job done. It's not enough. Insights say a lot more about the person who you're trying to influence than it does about the product or the service you're trying to sell. If you can find an insight about what motivates that person to do what they do, that's way more powerful than talking about your product, your service, your message. Insights are more about the category that a brand lives in than about the brand itself. So don't ask yourself, why do people drink Pepsi? Say, why do people drink soft drinks? What role does that fill in their lives? It fills some role. Insights reveal a whole lot more about what people want to feel as opposed to what they want to think. And if you come to the lecture tomorrow, we go into that a lot, right? But what people feel motivates us a whole lot more than what we think. I'll give you an example. Uh, do you know the, the retailer Sears? You have Sears out here? Um, I love Sears. Right? And, I, and I know that's like not a cool thing to say. I get it. I, but I love Sears. And I got to get my fill of Sears because I think by December, I think they're going to be gone, sadly. Uh, but if you asked me in research, why do I like Sears? And you said, hey, do they got good prices? I go, yeah, they got good prices. Are they conveniently located? Yeah, they're conveniently located. They got good, good selection of merchandise? Yeah, good selection of merchandise, right? But none of those things really have to do with why I like Sears, right? I like Sears because it's a store that had its beginning and for much of its life catered to blue collar working class people, of which my father was one, right? He was a union electrician. And I, I come from a family with three siblings, three sisters. So there wasn't always a ton of dad and me time, except when we went to Sears, you know? And when I walk into the Sears in Hicksville, Long Island, that's the name of the town, Hicksville. It's no derogatory name, which has not changed since 1961. And when, as soon as I walk through those doors, I swear to God, I'm a four-year-old kid holding my dad's hand. And that's why I like Sears, right? Because it just, it's a connection to my father, and it's just a warm memory that I have of walking into that store. I'm probably not going to reveal that in research. Most people wouldn't, right? We have to get really clever about getting at those feelings, doing research the right way is almost like doing therapy, Freudian therapy, and trying to get at what peeling back the layers of the onion, keep digging, keep digging, what 
motivates people to do what they do. Insights tend to be about things that are enduring, human truths, as opposed to what's the latest trend, what's the latest fad. Because it is about meeting the needs of someone, the emotional needs of somebody. Insights stimulate new ideas and new thinking, things that are just not the same old stuff, and I'll give you some examples of that. Insights explain things, they don't describe things. They tell you why people do what they do, not what they do. Right? It's not about what a consumer does, it's about what drives them to do it. It answers the question why, not the question what. So if you're looking at information, trying to formulate a strategy, if it looks like the thing you found answers the what, you haven't dug deep enough. You got to go one layer deeper. Why do they do that? Why do people do it? You will find insights about a lot of things. The ones about consumers are the most powerful. But you will find brand insights, you will find cultural insights, and you will find product insights. But focus on the consumer insights. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I think you know who it is, yeah, Mitt Romney, right? So this was in, what year did he run? 12? 2012, I guess it was. Um, and we studied him in my class up at uh, Columbia. And when we apply that model that I looked at, findings from the data, what's happening in culture, what happens with brands, when you look at the data and you look at all the different bits of information we had, you really come away with he was a one-dimensional candidate. And he was known for one thing and one thing only. And that's that he was a successful businessman. And if this sounds very familiar to the narrative Donald Trump used, he used this strategy exactly, right? The problem with Romney was he never defined why being a successful businessman matters. He just talked about it a lot. In fact, he abdicated that narrative to his competition. He let them define it. And the Democrats defined it as, you know what, you know what that means, being a successful businessman? It means he's one of those one percenters. He doesn't understand you. They filled in that narrative gap. What was happening in culture in 2012? We were coming out of the 2008 recession. Jobs were coming back, but it was kind of a slow slog. And salaries weren't recovering as quickly as they should. And people were kind of feeling, why is this taking so long? This should be quicker than this. I need to get a better job, more money. I need this to happen quicker. And what do we know about people in politics when they go to vote, right? In the 12 months leading up to an election, there's all sorts of conversation around social issues, financial issues, blah, 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 blah. There's all these different things. People take a point of view. They take a stance. They pick a candidate. But when they go into that voting booth, they tend to pull the lever for the candidate that is going to benefit them in some way, be that financial, social, or whatever. Right? So that's all the data we collected. The strategy, what he should have talked about, and this is exactly what Donald Trump did. He should have said, you want to know why you should vote for me? Because I'm a man of action. You know why being a successful businessman matters? Because in politics, you get four years, eight if you're lucky to do what you want to do. In business, you get 18 to 24 months to do it. And if you don't do it, you're out and the next guy gets a swing at it. In fact, the business Romney was in was fixing broken stuff. Bain Capital, they bought underperforming companies, brought in a new management team, fixed it, sold it for a profit, moved on to the next company. That's what he did for a living. He fixed broken stuff. 
You think the country's broken right now? The economy's broken? Vote for me. I know how to fix broken things. That's what he should have said. And it's exactly what Trump said. That's a whole nother thing. I was talking with Froger about the polling. Uh, that's a whole nother lecture. We can talk about that. Here's another example. Do you know this brand, Abercrombie and Fitch? Yeah. Uh, so this was actually uh, a pitch that we did at J. Walter Thompson. Uh, Abercrombie and Fitch targets uh, 11 to 18 year olds. That's their sweet spot. Okay? Um, and you're all probably too old now. You've aged out of the brand, right? You probably look at this brand and it feels dated to you. For 13 year olds, it's still cool. Right? You've just aged out of it. The brand hasn't changed. You have. Right? The findings from our data, we talked to teenagers and we talked to their parents. A lot of data, a lot of findings, kind of boils down to this. Parents realize they have to clothe their children and they're happy to do that. They do not want to spend a lot of money doing it. So when we asked parents, here's a list of retailers, rank order them in terms of where you would prefer to go to buy your kids clothes from, from most preferred to least preferred. Right? Number one, Walmart. Number two, Target. Number three, Sears. <laughs> At the very bottom of the list, Abercrombie and Fitch, American Apparel, Banana Republic, right? Don't want to spend that. Now you ask the kids the same question and you get a mirror image of the list. Right? Abercrombie and Fitch, number one, American Apparel, number two. Uh, Uniqlo, number three, and at the very, very bottom, Walmart, Target, right? Don't want to do that. Um, what we also learned is that parents said, listen, I will buy you the basic clothes you need, but I am not going to buy you a sweatshirt with a mousse for $85 because you think it's cool. If you want to do that, you spend your money. You've gotten money from your birthday, from allowance, from babysitting. You use your money. What do we know about culture, teen culture? Probably the most important thing to a teenager between the ages of 11 and 17 is social acceptance. Feeling like you're part of a group. Feeling like you're in the in crowd. Feeling like you are accepted in some way. And what do we know about brands? Well, clothes play a big role in that in telling other people whether you get it socially or not, right? I don't think Abercrombie and Fitch is in the business of selling apparel. I think they're in the business of selling social credibility. You choose, you choose Abercrombie and Fitch, it tells other people something about you. It tells them who you are. It tells them what you're interested in. It tells them why they should be friends with you. And more interestingly, because they're spending their own money at Abercrombie and Fitch, who is the competitive set? I would argue it's not limited to other apparel retailers. I would argue it's also GameStop. It's also iTunes. It's Xbox. It's anything a teenager spends money on to telescope to other people, I get it. I'm cool, I'm hip. Now, if you're Abercrombie and Fitch, that insight changes how you think about how you communicate to kids in this age group and how you market to them, right? That's that whole idea of insights take you in a different direction, make you think things you hadn't thought before. That's what that does. It makes you think very differently. You're not just competing with the guy down the mall. Yeah. I'll give you another clothing example, Lee jeans. And I know these aren't cool either, but what can I tell you? So uh, this was a project we worked on as well at J. Walter Thompson. <clears throat> when you look at uh, jean brands, right? And you look specifically at Lee. Lee jeans have very few brand equities, which means very few things that when people say Lee jeans, people go, oh, I know what they're about. 
they mean style or they mean classy or they mean cool. They don't have a lot of that. In fact, all they have, because they talk about it a lot, is comfort. That's what they talk about a lot. But comfort in a very functional way. They fit well. Right? And when you look at a consumer perceptual map of the jeans landscape, Levi's, Wrangler, and Lee, all right on top of each other. No differentiation in the consumer's mind between those brands, right? And all three of those brands see sales flat to soft to declining. So those brands are in dire need of a strategic positioning that pulls them apart and gives the consumer a reason to believe in them. What do we know about culture today? There's an interesting tension that goes on in culture today, which consumers are demanding authenticity from brands. I want transparency. I want authenticity. I want to know who the brand really is. Yet at the same time they're demanding that, they spend endless hours on social media carefully curating an image of themselves for the world. Right? So they want you to be authentic but they're quite happy for themselves to be quite inauthentic. Yeah? And what do we know about brands? Brands know that cool sells. Every brand wants to be cool. And it's really hard for a brand like Lee or Levi's or Wrangler to be cool, because they're not, right? So the strategy we came up with is you know what Lee Jeans is for? It's for people who don't need badges. It's for people who are so comfortable in who they are that they don't need brands to tell people who they are. They're comfortable enough in their own skin to just be themselves, to be authentic. Yeah? That's an area they can own because they already have comfort, now it's just giving new meaning to what does comfort mean to a brand. Right? So that's an example of taking data and turning it into something that's a little different. Uh, on to more exciting categories, mouthwash. So uh, J. Walter Thompson does all the global advertising for Listerine. Uh, Listerine has been around almost as long as J. Walter Thompson. It's about 120 years old. It was literally created by a physician, Dr. Lister, and it was originally developed as an antiseptic before surgery. They've changed it a bit so you can swish it around in your mouth. Right? Um, and I, th I think, I don't know, let's see if video plays here. Let's see if this works. No, maybe not. Okay, I'll tell you about it then. Uh, one of the creatives came to me one afternoon and he said, you know, we've got this belief that people who use Listerine are bolder than people who don't. Could we prove that? I thought about it for like five minutes. I said, yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. That would be fun, right? So we did a bunch of surveys and we just asked people, tell me about your mouthwash usage. Which brands of mouthwash do you use? Which brands don't you use? And then we asked them a whole bunch of questions about things they do. Do you know how to juggle or not? Have you ever seen the Aurora Borealis? Have you ever eaten chocolate covered crickets? Right, all sorts of crazy things. And you know what, on like 90% of them, Listerine users do those things more than non-Listerine users, right? I mean, the story they wanted to tell is that if you use Listerine, you'll become bolder. And I do believe there's a correlation between the two, but I think the causality actually flows the other way. It's that bold people seek bold experiences and Listerine is just another bold experience. So it's one of the things they do. But it led to a whole campaign. We did it around the world. We learned things like Listerine users are more likely to bench press their own weight, ride a motorcycle, juggle, do a handstand, break dance, and do splits. 
by like two and three to one. Right? It was fascinating. 110% uh, more likely to have dyed their hair a bold color. Uh, 1.9 times more likely to have completed a triathlon. Three times more likely to say no to their mother-in-law. That's bold. Uh, more likely to perform a dance. Um, more likely to have partied on blah, 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 blah. We found like all this stuff. That became the campaign. That is the campaign. I don't know why I can't play it here. But if you look up Listerine Study of Bold, you'll see the campaign that ran on air. And that's what it, and it has been ridiculously successful. In a category and a brand, Listerine's the category leader. I think they have like an 80% share of mouthwash, at least in this country. Um, and the category has been flattening, maturing, and their share has been declining a little bit against competition from generic brands. This campaign within six months saw a 7% sales lift, which in marketing terms, you're like high-fiving down the hallway. That's huge. You never see that. Right? I think it connected to people. I think people said, because I think being bold is another word for being cool. And everybody wants to be cool on some level, right? So this said, you know what? There's a relationship. If you do this, then you're in that in crowd. You're in the cool crowd. You get it. And it's been driving sales ever since. Okay. Sorry I couldn't show you the video, but that's, that's what I got. So what questions might you have? See, a good researcher doesn't ask any questions. That can be answered by a no. That's wrong. What question says, I know you got them? What questions do you have? Yes? How much of it was? Uh, All of it. Yeah. Uh, in a pitch, no. I mean, some, in, in the ad world, some clients, when they, when they have a pitch, they will have a budget that they will reimburse you for it. It's usually nowhere near what you spend on the pitch. So since we're an internal research function, it's not that expensive. I think the Abercrombie and Fitch study maybe cost about 20 grand, roughly. But depending on the prize, how big that contract would be for us, we could spend upwards of $100,000 on spec. None. <laughs> uh, normal pitch is two to four weeks. Now, sometimes that's good, right? I forget who said it. I think it was Leonard Bernstein. He said something like, to do great things, we need two, two things. We need uh, a really big challenge and not quite enough time. Right? And that's what pitches always feel to me, because it's like you have to go with what feels right. And often that's the best thing, because you can spend a lot of time overthinking those things. What other questions? All right, then I have questions for you. All right, I'll ask next. My experience at Columbia is it's a business. <laughs> how would I use this? How would you like do things like looking for an insight and finding an insight in something that's less business but then other things? I mean, I, <clears throat> I also run uh, a very small not-for-profit called Research in Kind, which gets people who do research in the business world to donate their time to non-for-profits, right? Uh, so one of our clients is, uh, and again, we just donate our time, is the Donaldson Adoption Institute. Who? Right, we said the same thing. Who? Who are they? Um, apparently in the US today, uh, there are no federal guidelines around adoption and foster care. They're all state by state. And in 35 of the 50 states, the concept of rehoming is a legal concept. You know what rehoming is? I and my wife adopt a child, and after like a couple years, we go, hmm, it's kind of not working out for us. Over lunch, 
I could transfer guardianship of that child to a friend of mine just writing on a sheet of paper. It is easier in 35 out of the 50 states to transfer guardianship of a child than it is to transfer ownership of an automobile. Right? So this woman from Donaldson Adoption, she said the problem is they need to be able to lobby Congress. And in, in, able to be, in order to be able to lobby Congress, they need data and information. Right? So we went out and did huge surveys among people in the adoption community, both the adoptees and the adoptive parents, as well as the lawyers who sort of negotiate those deals. And the whole goal was to come up with what would make a congressman put this on the docket? What would make this an issue for them? And it was really the numbers around rehoming. And when you ask consumers about that concept, across the board, 90% of people are like horrified by it. Parents, 100% are horrified by it, right? That's, so we learned what are the triggers to go in to get them to do it. So it's not limited to selling mouthwash. Anytime you're trying to get someone to do something, uh, Doctors Without Borders, do you know them? We worked with them at Columbia. Doctors Without Borders is an interesting organization because it is run by physicians. Even their communications is run by physicians, right? So all their marketing sounds like a doctor's saying it. We inoculated 2,700,000 people in the fourth quarter of last year. We helped eradicate blah, blah, blah. all these things they did with big numbers. And every time I read it, it sounded like, sounds like you're doing a great job. What do you need me for? Like you got it all fixed, right? It's all solved. <clears throat> and they had no concept of the way people see them. Do you guys all know what they do? Yeah? So uh, Syria, there's a whole lot of Doctors Without Borders personnel in Syria. What they do is they go into war-torn areas where people need medical assistance and no one else will go in there. So they just go in. They don't ask permission. They don't go in under the cover of the UN. They just go and do it. They have these mobile hospitals they go in with. They bring the drugs with them, and they just go in and do it. They're like physician cowboys, you know? But I think that's who they are. And I think that's a motivating idea. Where most people run from danger, they run to it. Right? And they're sort of like superheroes in a way. And that's where we ended up with them. If you really want people to sort of, you've got to create the icon of this super image and let people know what you guys do. And that'll start bringing people in. And it, and it worked for them, worked very well for them. What other questions? Yes. Research or advertising or marketing? Um, just research in general. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's going to be called that much longer. I mean, I, and I say that because there's research, which sounds like a dated term. Everyone's talking about calling it insights, but now there's data analytics, and the two are sort of dancing around each other trying to figure out what they are. I would say this. Uh, do not go work for a client right out of the gate because you'll learn nothing, right? Most clients do not do research anymore. The, the, the clients, people on the client side who work in the market research department are highly specialized procurement agents. They know where to go to get it and how to buy it and how to vet good from bad, but they don't do much of it anymore. Um, the best place to get it is at a market research company. And I would say, try and get three different experiences within your first 10 years. Traditional market research and insights, quantitative, followed up by qualitative research, followed up by data analytics. They don't have to be in that order, but get those three, right? Because I think the market researcher of the future is what I call a research alchemist. Right? They understand all these different data streams. They can pull them together. They can sort of mix them together and understand the good, the bad, and the ugly with them, but use everything at their disposal to tell. Right now, the industry is very siloed. But the people who have cross-discipline experience, 
they're going to be worth a ton of money. That's what I think. I had a boss who once said to me, you know, all of us come out of the womb one way or another. We're either kind of qual people and we like stories and words, or we're quant people and we like numbers. And it's pretty easy to know which one you are, if you think about it for more than five minutes. She said, so figure out which one you are and then spend the rest of your career trying to be the other one. She says, you'll never be it, but it'll provide a nice balance that you'll be able to then think about things. Because this is where insights come from. It's not the data. It's thinking and connecting the dots. And that is very much a qualitative exercise. So try and get those. Was that helpful? Yeah. No, people love them. Because you weren't really saying anything different and you weren't saying anything bad. You were saying this is for people who have confidence at the end of the day. That's kind of what you were saying, just saying it a little bit differently. Yes. Can you talk about your thought that there must be some tricks or um, things that you do once you're given a project that kind of leads you to your insights? Uh, there's not something that leads us there. I mean, what we try and do is we've tried to, again, you need to peel back the layers of the onion. You need to get deep underneath what people really feel. So it's not that first blush thing, right? You have to keep probing them. Well, why do you feel that way? It's, it's, like, it's like therapy with a, you know, with a psychologist. You know? Well, tell me why you think that. Well, what do you feel about that? What do you think that means to you, right? You're constantly trying to pull that back from people. Qualitative research has done this for years. The issue is how do you quantify it? Because in a quantified setting, a survey setting, it almost forces left brain thinking, very rational based thinking. So what we've done is we've adopted some of the qualitative techniques and brought them over into the quantitative world. So we use a lot of what we call projective techniques. Right? Projective techniques are, uh, think about, here's five brands in a category. Right, so I don't know, pick them, Coke, Pepsi, Fanta, whatever, right? Uh, but instead of thinking them about, thinking of them as if they are cola brands or soda brands, I want you to imagine you've been asked to put on a fifth grade show about a fifth grade classroom. And there's the cool kid, there's the dorky kid, there's the mean teacher, the nice teacher, the janitor, the cool gym teacher, right? There's all these archetypes of school, which brand would play which role in that, right? What that does is it sort of releases them from their left brain thinking. It releases them from the imagery that they've associated in their mind and they now have to work off of what I call latent gut associations. And those help us understand what do people really feel about this brand and what connects them. And then we do techniques like, what's your favorite brand? And if we took that away from you, if that went away, how would that affect you? Right? And there are some people who just go, I don't care, I use this brand. But other people get really bent out of shape. Right? So Coca-Cola learned this, right? The classic case, you all are probably too young to remember this, but Back in, when was it, 80, <clears throat> mid-80s, Coca-Cola got rid of Coca-Cola and replaced it with New Coke, right? And people got pissed off. I mean, there were petitions, there were marches. Like, I don't know what these people got, like, a lot of time on their hands. But people were really not happy about this, right? Now, the interesting thing is the reason Coke did it is because in blind taste tests, people preferred the new formulation of Coke over the old formulation of Coke five to one. The problem was they did them blinded. 
when they redid the tests and had the brands there that people could see, the numbers flipped the other way. Because the brand means so much to people, right? I was reading an academic article once about the, the inability of our taste buds to tell the difference between different flavors. What percent of people do you think can tell the difference blindfolded between Coke and Sprite? What do you think? Forty-five percent of people blindfolded, right? And I was I was giving this lecture once, and people were like, "No, I can tell the difference. It's easy, right?" So I said, "Well, let's do it." So we did it, and we got about forty-two percent could tell. And then would play games with them, would give them two sprites and say, which one's the Coke? They'd be like, oh, it's that one. <laughs> we really don't know. Our gustatory experience with products is completely informed by the branding that's been wrapped around it for so many years. Right? I had a graduate student who was doing her thesis on boxed wine. You know what that is, right? Wine that comes in a box, right? And well, that's the reaction. Most people go, well, that's crap. Who would ever drink wine from a box, right? And what she was trying to prove, so at her thesis presentation, she did a little taste test. It was 8 in the morning, but we did a little taste <laughs> test. It was OK, right? And she had a couple of bottles and some wine poured in it, and a couple of boxes and some wine poured in it. And the review panel had to taste both and weigh in on which one was better. And unanimously across the board, the review panel was ecstatic about the bottled wine, how good it was, the flavor, the bouquet. I mean, they were going on and on and on about it. Uh, and it was all boxed wine, all of it. They had put the boxed wine in the bottle. Right? But the presence of the bottle changes how people perceive their experience drinking the wine. Right? If brands went away tomorrow, we would struggle to navigate the world, I think. We wouldn't know what car to get into. We wouldn't know what Uber to drive, right? We wouldn't know anything because brands give us beacons and guidance and tell us things. So that's what we're trying to get at is what we call the latent associations, right? If someone says the word BMW to you, within about half a second, your brain goes through this process of connecting ideas. Every idea, it's ever connected to the term BMW. And the terms that you've connected to it more frequently come more quickly to you. Right? So you sit there and you go BMW, German, BMW, luxury, BMW, German, Autobahn, right? You go through all this stuff. You may even go German, Nazis. No, that's too far. <laughs> Not that. Right? And you settle on what they call a neuronal cloud of understanding. That is your reality of what that brand means. That's what we're trying to get at in research, is what are all those associations? What are the latent associations? I work with some research companies that use what they call biometric techniques to get at this. They, it, some of it is based on, have you ever heard of the Stroop test? Stroop test is, is uh, was, as from the 20s, I think, uh, psychologists. And what they learned is that when you associate two things more strongly in your mind, they come to your mind more quickly. What, the, what Dr. Stroop did was he showed people a bunch of words. All the words were colors. Yellow, Y-E-L-L-O-W, green, G-R-E-E-N. Sometimes the font of the word matched the color of the word. Sometimes it didn't. When the font matched, people could recall it much more quickly, right? So they have developed now what they call implicit attitude tests, which are trying to understand the relationship between two items, and it's judging it based on how quickly you respond. If you, if you go online and look up Project Implicit from Harvard, they have some of the tests there you can take that will tell you how racially biased you are, how biased you are against fat people, right? And people take this and they're alarmed by their biases, right?
Do we live in a racially biased country? You bet we do. We've gotten really good at knowing when to say it and when not to say it. But those subconscious latent associations are still there. Yeah? Some of it's hardwired because we are tribal species. We are a species that feels comfortable when we are with people who are like us. Right? But that's what we're trying to get at in research. We're trying to get at what are those latent associations, positive, negative, embarrassing, or otherwise, and then think about what do those mean? How much do those play in terms of motivating people to do what we want them to do? And then how do we turn that into a strategy, a calm strategy? What other question? Yes. Uh, it's what we call being middle-brained. You're equally comfortable with numbers and you're equally comfortable with ideas. And you have to have the facility to be able to go back and forth between the two pretty rapidly. <clears throat> it's not normal for most people to have that. But it can be developed. And it's kind of what my boss had said once. You know, figure out what you are and then work really hard to be the other and then you'll develop sort of a nice rounded toolkit to be able to do both. In insights too, it's sort of an insatiable curiosity. You're never kind of happy with the answer, right? I, I'm sure I drive my family crazy because I'm always like, why? Why is that? Gee, I wonder why that is. Why is that? Why is that? Like, oh, who cares? It is, right? But I need to know, right? I want to know why, right? And it's that sort of insatiable curiosity. You just keep digging and digging and digging and digging. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I bet it's true. Same thing. Yes. Regardless of how crappy their product is. We call it putting lipstick on the pig. You know? Sometimes there is. You know, good products sell themselves. Beer that makes you younger doesn't need an ad campaign, right? That's just going to sell. But that's not the reality of the business world today. The reality of the business world today is that uh, most brands are at parity. There is barely distinguishable differences between them. And whatever differences there are, the competition can figure it out and copy you in a very quick, short amount of time. <clears throat> so more often than not, we're dealing with trying to imbibe meaning where product differentiations don't exist. I'll give you an example. Vodka. Right? I was just reading a blog post the other day by a guy in the ad industry who was pitching some vodka brand and he went to the factory. Because when you work in, in, in advertising, uh, the first thing they do is they take you to the factory where the stuff's made so you can see it, to look for something interesting and really understand how it's made. And what he saw was five different brands of vodka, five different bottles, five different brands, five different price points, all with the same liquid going in. Vodka is a tasteless, odorless product that people are willing to spend five times as much for one brand over another brand. And blindfolded, they couldn't tell you the difference. It's all marketing. It's all marketing. And you can see what it means to people. We were doing focus groups once with a guy, and we were talking about uh, absolute vodka. And we'd gone around the room and said, what's your favorite brand of vodka? And everyone tells us. And one guy said Kettle One, which is one of the super premium brands. right? And we said to him, why do you like Kettle One? And he, starts, he stands up in a focus group, which right away you're like, what's he doing? <laughs> right? So he stands up and he says, I like Kettle One because it's triple distilled. And I like Kettle One because it only uses water from the Ural Mountains of Russia. And I like Kettle One because, and he, he ticks off like 20 of these things. 
And every, all my students in the back room are like writing this all down. I'm like, stop, 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 stop. I said, that's got nothing to do with it. That's all what we call the justifying narrative. The bullshit story that makes him feel good. Notice what he did. He stood up. He proclaimed his brilliance about Kettle One. And he said the brand name 20 times. I prefer Kettle One. He thinks Kettle One's a very cool brand. People who drink it are cool. He drinks it, and goddamn, by the end of this soliloquy, you're going to think I'm pretty cool for drinking it too. That's what he was trying to do, right? But that's what we sort of have to read through, read between the lines to see what people are saying and meaning, right? But that's what we're trying to do, is put meaning somewhere where it doesn't exist. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you students are interested, and, and you don't have to say yes, in a, in a career in advertising, potentially, or not? Interested? Really? Wow. And, and is that your major? Is that what you're going to school for? Oh, then that makes sense. Good. <laughs> um, because I sit on the board of the AEF, as I said, and we're talking about there that uh, advertising and marketing is having a bit of a crisis in that the talent pipeline is not nearly as robust as it once was, right? They're not getting the volume of people through the funnel. And we believe some of that has to do with there are other things that look much sexier than marketing and advertising in the world in that the way academia schedules the programs Right, that you don't really get to the cool classes sort of until the end. So people who might have been interested have already bailed out because it seemed advertising 101 seemed kind of boring. I got to tell you, advertising is, in my opinion, uh, the best industry in the world. Absolutely love it. I don't know what it's going to be like 20 years from now, but there's an old saying that advertising is really hard to get into and it's harder to get out of it because you are surrounded by some of the most interesting, quirky, creative, genius people you've ever met. And I love it. I mean, I just love being around these people. It's a fun, fun career. OK, any other questions? No kidding. I know. So what's the career choices for people, you know? Do people just quit advertising agencies? No, I think a lot of them go and start their own shops. They start their own businesses. They go into consultancies. Uh, they go client side. I know some of the strategic planners that I knew are now uh, chief strategy officers at big packaged goods companies. So, I mean, there's a career path, but it is very young. I know at J. Walter Thompson, the average age, average, right, is 26. So I'm like way on the other side of that curve. I keep waiting for them to go, I'm oh, Mr. Truss. Time's up. <laughs> no, I think it's because younger people are the ones that are more in tune with culture and they understand culture and often the people that marketers are coveting the most are youth. And OK, so I'm going to say this now. Don't get offended. But as you get older, uh, brands and what they tell other people about you become less important. right? So for younger people, they use brands as a way to tell people who they are. And it's a shortcut. It's an easy heuristic to say to someone, oh, I like this brand, oh, they must be like this. And you make those judgments all the time when you first meet someone. You look at their clothes, you look at the shoes they're wearing, you look at the laptop they have, what phone do they have, all those things tell you something about them. And in an instant, you make a judgment. Right? But as you get older, and things like your family, your career, your interests, start to define you more than brands, Brands matter less. They don't not matter at all, 
They just matter less. So marketers are always interested in getting to the youth. So they want younger people who are in that, in the same mindset as them. Can you give a background though? I mean, I, I covered the beauty industry for 25 years and Estee Lauder signed Kendall Jenner to the mm. stage. And I mean, you've got like a 60 or 70 year old customer on Instagram signing a yeah. 19 or 20 year old company. Yeah. I mean, does, we, I felt like we saw the pushback from that. I mean, do you? That might just be a bad match between the brand and the, right? I mean, spokespeople are tricky because you want them to share the same brand values you have, but at the same time, bring something maybe you don't. But that may have been too far of a leap. I, I honestly thought they crossed the line. Yeah. <laughs> I assume it didn't work too well. Actually, it's worked surprisingly well, which really Oh, okay. Works. All right, good. So maybe it was good then, who yeah. knows? But you know, sometimes brands do that because their, their consumer base is just aging as a cohort and no one's coming in underneath. I worked for a while on Reader's Digest. You guys ever heard of them? You did, yeah? You wanna know the average age of a Reader's Digest reader? And this was 15 years ago. Average, 82 was the average. That means half of them are older than that. Right? They are literally going off the cliff. And nobody is coming in. Cohort is aging, and behind it, they're like, where is everybody? And they're like, not our brand, man. So maybe they felt they had. Hope to see you tomorrow.